Thanks everyone for joining us today for a topic with teeth, what's behind your pet smile. I am Dr. Steve Weinrock. I am the Chief Veterinary Officer here at TruePanion. I'm also the founder of Mighty Vet. Uh, before TruePanion, I had uh, built uh, and run three of my own veterinary hospitals from the ground up. My wife's also a veterinarian. Um, and with me today to talk about this topic is Dr. Pa Patrick Vall. Patrick, can you, uh, you give a quick intro too? Thanks, Steve. Um, I'm Dr. Patrick Vall. I'm a veterinarian. Uh, I was born and raised in Cleveland, Ohio. Uh, so I'm a born and raised Buckeye. I went to Franciscan University for my undergrad, and then I went to The Ohio State University College of Veterinary Medicine. I graduated in 1992. And I went into general practice for about the first 17 years of my career and really enjoyed it. I, I owned two different practices, one in Maryland, and then my wife and I moved back to her native Colorado. And uh, I was enjoying my career, but I realized I wanted to do something different and I didn't quite know what that was. When I graduated from vet school, I'll, I'll be totally honest here, I, I actually hated dentistry. I didn't enjoy it. It wasn't a strength of mine. And so you know, I really spent the first 17 years of my career kind of struggling with that. And so I knew I wanted to do something different. And um, I ended up taking some dental courses from Dr. Tony Woodward in Colorado Springs, and it totally changed my career. And I fell in love with dentistry at that point and totally changed how I was practicing. I ended up selling my, my clinic. I did two years of ER medicine, and then I started my dental residency through the American Veterinary Dental Association or um, American Veterinary Dental College. And I did a four year residency program, became credentialed and took boards, passed boards and I'm a board certified veterinary dentist here in Colorado Springs. So if you told me 20 years ago that I would have moved my family cross country to Colorado, sold my general practices and gone into veterinary dentistry, I would have never ever believed you, but it's really become the passion of my career, thoroughly enjoy what I'm doing. I'm now part owner of five different hospitals and we're growing as far as the, um, the business that we're building. We're really excited about what we're doing and the impact that we're having on our pets and uh, on the profession itself. Thanks so much, Dr. Ball. That, that's amazing. Uh, you, you talked on your residency. I want to I want to pick back up on that later. That sounds like uh, an awful lot of schooling. I've done uh, 11 years of higher education myself, but you you might have me uh, me beat there. So <laughs> I want to sync back up on that again. Um, but th this is interesting. Over 83 percent of pets over the age of three have signs of dental disease. And I think that's I think that's pretty tragic. And um, you know, it's uh, we happen to be in Pet Dental Health Month, which I think is a bit crazy. Love to hear your opinion on that too. But it should be um, you know Dental Health Year, not Dental Health Month. Um, and um, before we get your thoughts on that, something that I always used to say to my clients is, you know, we brush, we floss, we use mouthwash, and we still go to the dentist twice a year. And because of it, we live longer. There's a direct correlation between life expectancy and dental hygiene, and it's the same with our pets. But I know of no people that brush their pets twice, that brush their pets' teeth twice a day, that floss, that use mouthwash, and that have twice yearly professional dental cleanings. So I think it's it's really important, and I'd love for you to to, to educate a little bit about that, if you could, Dr. Bell. Sure, sure. So. I think what we got to ask ourselves is, you know, it's really not apples to oranges. What would our mouths look like if we went weeks or months or years without dental care? What, you know, we wouldn't have any friends and we wouldn't get a job uh, if that happened to us. And yet so many of, of our pets uh, don't get dental care with any type of regularity. So, you know, why does it matter? Why do we fuss about that? Why do we have Dental Health Awareness Month, yeah. um, and and we wish that it was Dental Year Awareness Month because they need dental care far more than just once a, a year um, at a given month. So, you know, why does it matter? Well, dental disease hurts. It hurts quite a bit for our pets, and the problem is is that they're so stoic that they hide their pain. They don't want to tell us that they hurt. They can be dealing 
with dental pain for weeks or months or years before a pet owner starts to notice any changes. Uh, they can still be eating. That survival instinct to eat is so strong. They simply don't give it up and they'll keep eating through a world of hurt when they're dealing with really serious infection within their mouths. And, and what I stress to my, my clients, our pet owners, is that to show pain for a pet is to show weakness. To show weakness is to be more susceptible as prey. And, and even though they may not have natural predators in their environment, it's still very much a part of their genetic makeup. And they don't wanna, they don't wanna let on that they hurt. Uh, so, you know, you mentioned that 83% of pets have um, dental disease by the time that they're three. I think if anything, that may be an underestimation. I think more pets actually have that. In the facility that I work at in Colorado Springs, um, it's especially practice. And we probably have, you know, at least 50 pets at any given time um, within our two buildings in our facility. And I bet if we went around, we would actually find that well over 90% of them have some type of dental disease. And maybe the five to 10% that don't have it are puppies and kittens that haven't had the opportunity to get dental disease yet, or they're the ones that are, that are being actively treated. So I think if anything, sometimes we, we probably underestimate the percentage of pets that have dental disease. The wonderful thing is that when we treat that, that dental disease, when we relieve that pain, so many times the pet owners will notice some type of improvement in their pet's behavior and their activity level uh, and how they're behaving. So when we get dental care, yeah, um, you know, we ideally, in addition to our daily care, we should be going to our dentist every six months for a cleaning. And that's true prevention. That's what a prophylaxis means. And as a dental profession, we've really gotten away from calling our dental procedures a dental prophy. Yeah, because unfortunately for so many of our pets, it's not true prevention. It's actually active treatment. So I make this analogy and I don't, I don't feel like this is a stretch. When um, a human gets their dental prophy, it's the equivalent of a dog getting a parvo vaccination. But when our pets come into us for dental cleanings and dental treatments, the majority of the time, unfortunately, it's kind of like treating parvo disease. It's kind of like treating parvo of the mouth. And if you look at those pictures on the right, I know it's, it's hard for some people to look at, but that was a dachshund that came into me a number of years ago that needed full mouth extractions. Every single tooth in his mouth was rotten and infected and uh, falling out. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a bit, but um, that was the equivalent of treating parvovirus of the mouth in a patient like this. Um, so one of the other things we have to keep in mind, we know in humans, there's definite association of dental disease and negative, what we call systemic ramifications or disease outside of the oral cavity and other organ systems. So with dogs and cats, we know that when they have dental disease, they have histologic or tissue changes, negative tissue changes in the heart, liver, and kidneys. And when their periodontal disease is worse, the severity of those negative changes in the tissues actually worsens as well. And we know that with many pets, we see diabetes in our patients. Um, and for those diabetic pets, they can be far more difficult to regulate um, when they have periodontal disease. So with humans, you look at the case on the right, a human with pretty significant gingivitis. They're dealing with some gingival recession, um, you know, pretty significant changes going on. And we know that when humans have poor oral uh, hygiene, when they're dealing with dental disease, there's a definite association with all these negative, um, all these diseases that you see in that column there. So Alzheimer's patients, I'm not saying that dental disease causes Alzheimer's by any stretch, but we know that Alzheimer's patients actually have bacteria that um, is growing in the mouth, in the oral cavity, actually going to the brain of those patients. We know that there's an association of dental disease with autoimmune disease, heart disease, respiratory disease, uh, certainly with diabetes, just like we see in pets. 
Um, women that are pregnant and have dental disease have far more complications. Uh, the beauty of that is that when they get their dental disease treated, those complications tend to resolve. But here's a key thing. Humans that have dental disease die earlier. They have a higher mortality rate. Um, so if we, if we look at humans versus dental patients, you know, that's a human on the left with pretty significant dental disease. You look at the, the anesthetized patient on the right there, this is a dog that came into me and again, uh, end stage periodontal disease, very few if any viable teeth in that dog's mouth. Uh, and, and sadly, this is a common thing that I see. This is not rare with what I experience almost on a daily basis in my practice. And so if we know that with humans with dental uh, issues, they have this higher association with all these other systemic disease problems, how much more so with dogs and cats that are dealing with dental disease, like what you see on the right, and even sooner than that when they're dealing with just basic gingivitis. Hey, Dr. Vall, this is a perfect opportunity for us to cut over to one of your specialty dental hospitals and uh, take, a, take a look at what's behind the exam room door. Here we have our patient still on the dental table finishing up the cleaning, but we have an entire separate monitoring system going on simultaneously because our patient is under general anesthesia. So here I have a second technician, Morgan, who's currently monitoring and writing down all the vital parameters that we monitor. On the anesthesia circuit, you can see that we actually can control our oxygen and our anesthetic gas that goes directly on this circular, on this um, rebreathing circuit to the patient. And then here they have their rebreathing bag. All of our patients do get an intravenous catheter plate so that we can give them fluid replacement therapy. And then we have them on a few different types of monitoring equipment. As you can see here, we can monitor the heart rate as well as the ECG rhythm to make sure that they don't have any evidence of arrhythmia. We can see the oxygen percentage or SpO2. 100% is the goal, which we have this patient right now. And then we can see some waveforms and rates related to the respiration. Very importantly down here, we actually have a separate monitoring system for the blood pressure. Just like in people, we like to monitor systolic, diastolic, and mean arterial. And just as a double checks and balances system, my technician Morgan here actually has an ultrasonic Doppler detector as well. That you can kind of hear faintly in the background, we can hear heart rate on that. One other vital parameter as well on this monitor is the temperature. We like to make sure that our patients stay at a physiologic temperature so that the recovery is nice and smooth and we can get them home the same day. Yeah, so that's a, I think that's a really good video of, um, of a, a day in the life of a dog that's uh, undergoing a dental and the veterinary team that's there caring for it. Of course, one of the things that we always tell people, um, and your veterinarian will tell you specifically before a dental, is we want to make sure the dog is fasted so they don't regurgitate any food and run into any problems uh, breathing that food in. That brings us right into our next question. So Dr. Val, we have a question from uh, Dr. Tina Tran who called in. She's also a, a veterinarian out in Arizona. And her question was regarding food and uh, she has a lot of clients that come in and ask her about specific foods. Some people may say, oh, well, I don't need to do anything to my, to my dog's teeth. I feed raw diets. Some people may say, oh, this says it's special for, uh, for dental hygiene and I should use this specific diet. Can you, can you give us any thoughts on that? Is there any specific kind of magic food that's going to make it so you don't need to brush your dog's teeth uh, or go in for routine dental care? Is there anything that's better than something or things that should just be avoided? Sure. Yeah, I wish there was a magic diet that would treat it because I'd feed it to my kids, right? Yeah. Um, but there are a handful of prescription diets that are made specifically for dental health. Um, and some of them are, are based on the way that their fibers come together and then they're broken apart as a, as a dog or cat chews um, the kibble. Other uh, dry diets have ingredients in them that actually uh, can decrease uh, the amount of minerals in plaque and make it less likely to mineralize and form calculus. So they work in different ways and they can definitely help 
here's the key thing. Diet by itself will never treat, prevent dental disease. I wish it was that easy, but it's simply not. So again, if I have a client with, and they're highly motivated, they have a dog or a cat with a history of dental disease, they're pulling out all the stops. They're trying to do everything they can. They're bringing them into us regularly for cleanings under anesthesia. They're doing home care on a daily basis, but their pets still have dental disease taking place or, um, or recurring. So in those cases, uh, I'll add a dental diet to the protocol. And I think that that's meaningful in that situation. Um, I wish that, you know, the raw diet thing was true. It would make dental care for pets a lot easier. It's simply not. And there's not data to support that. And we always have to be data driven in what we recommend um, to our pets or to our pet owners. So, um, yeah, we just we have to uh, we have to look at what's available to us as far as the data. So we've got some of the coolest pet parents in the world, uh, true Panion members and um, and uh, subscribers to our friends over at We Rate Dogs. And we've literally got hundreds of submissions uh, for pets smiling. Love to share some of these. Uh, let's uh, let's let's see what we got on the screen here. Um, this is, ooh, look at that. Look, that's a serious smile right there. This was, uh, submitted through Instagram and that is, look at, what do you think of that, Dr. Paul? That's just some serious jockers right there. I think AJ needs a nap. <laughs> I love it. I, I, if, uh, if pictures could <laughs> talk, this, this one says a whole lot. <laughs> All right, let's, uh, let's check out another one. What else we got? Look at those eyes. That's amazing. And um, next we have uh, Fisher via Facebook. Fisher is a True Panion member um, and uh, currently going through some some illness treatment. So I'm glad we're able to help with that. But uh, yeah, that's <laughs> I love that bib. That's amazing. Can't quite tell where we're looking down there. Looks like there's some something, something yummy down below or. <laughs> Excellent. Who else do we have here? Next one we've got, it looks like Kane. Thank you so much. A True Penion member submitted a picture of Kane through Facebook as well. That's awesome. Who else we got here? Let's see. We literally received hundreds of these things um, and, and they're all, um, as our uh, as our friends at We Rate Dogs would say, proper thirteens out of ten. <laughs> so we've got uh, Gunner via Instagram. Oh, look at that! Excellent. Look at those choppers. Now we need the we need the opinion of the uh, board certified dentist here. That's uh, that's a nice looking grill. It is. He's um, he's what we would call a, a brachycephalic breed. Um, shorter nose, and quite often these dogs have um, a pretty significant underbite, and all the more need. Guess what, Steve? For dental care. Yeah, that's that's what I'm talking about. And obviously, we've got some parents that that uh, that love him there as well. And let's see who else we got. We've got Bagel through Twitter. Thank you, Bagel. Oh, look at you! Excellent. We look like we're we we. We're about to make a lunge for something. Not quite sure about it. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. Thank you for that. Who else we got here? We've got Callie through Facebook. Thank you for your submission. We're going for the wind blowing look today. I like it. Who's <laughs> back? Ready to party. That's another uh, brachycephalic flat face breed there too. So um I love making sure these guys stick with us for as long as they possibly can, make sure their dental hygiene is taken care of. And we have Emmeline. I apologize if I'm pronouncing that wrong, but that's through Facebook, another another True Panion member as well. Oh, that's gorgeous. Yeah. What do you think, Patrick? The brachycephalic breeds are, are definitely making a, a splash tonight. Yeah. And I love that little necktie as well. Yeah. And let's see. 
We've got another one coming up here. We've got uh, we've got our friend Daisy. Uh, Daisy is coming at us from Facebook, and it like looks like Daisy is protected with True Penion. Thank you very much for that. And look at the whiter than the snow. Look at that. Yeah. I love it. It's like camouflage. The teeth are so nice. And those canines are beautiful. Yeah, I think she loves the snow. I think that's safe to say. <laughs> it's like we're about to dine on some snow. Yeah. And then we've got uh, Alice and Otis. We got the, the duo here. Beautiful. Now that that actually really looks like a smile. Like yeah. You're posing the camera here. Um, yeah. And how, how often do you see uh, the poodle type breeds and the poodle mixes, Dr. Val? All the time. All yep, the time. They're one of the ones up there with Yorkshire Terriers, yep. uh, Jacksons that, um, you know, uh, typically, um, you know, we, we see dental problems in these guys. So if you want them to live to ripe old ages, we need to make sure their teeth are taken care of. Um, you know, poodles are, are, are prone to uh, diabetes as well. Um, and, and these things, surprise, surprise, are, are linked to, uh, to teeth, as Dr. Val was talking about earlier. All right. Um, so we got one more here. So we don't run out of time. We got Buddy from Facebook. Thank you to uh, to Buddy's parents. Uh, Buddy is also a True Penion member. Look at that. And what does that say in the background? I'm not sure. Love. Love. Right? Love. Yeah. Okay. I can't see the E. You're better, you're better than I am at this. Uh, <laughs> that's what I'm talking about. Beautiful picture. Thank you for submitting that. What a wonderful smile. I think it reminds me of my days in practice myself. Every day I would see heart disease, liver disease, kidney disease, dental disease as well, of course. Um, but people would say to me, you know, there's there's certain things I can't prevent. Um, it, it's a shame um, my cat died of kidney disease. It's a shame my dog had heart disease or liver disease, um, you know, but there wasn't much we could do. And we would always try to have a conversation about, well, Actually, there is, for all those reasons you just said, it's the teeth. It's the teeth that's the common denominator. And if we could take care of those teeth, we might have a better life expectancy. We might have a better quality of life along the way. But there seems to be this fear um, of, of putting our pets through a dental anesthesia process. And what are the risks and what are the rewards? Uh, I'd love to hear your thoughts about that. Why, why are people so um, so hesitant to do this? Uh, is it just an education thing or are there other things to talk about? Sure, sure. Um, you know, I think the biggest reservation is um, they're concerned about anesthesia. And, and I get it. I understand it. No one enjoys having their pets go under anesthesia. That being said, the veterinary profession has just grown by leaps and bounds as far as the standards that we keep and the advances that we've made as far as making anesthetic procedures more and more safe for pets. Um, you know, in my clinic, I know we have a dedicated anesthesia tech and a dedicated dental tech um, at all times with that patient in addition to the doctor and other staff members. So, you know, we're committed to them. I. Uh, I'll show some slides in a second as far as um, the way that we monitor our patients, all the different ways that uh, we really try to practice with the highest standards um, as far as pain relief and anesthetic safety. Uh, here's the thing that I stress to people, Steve. I'm far more concerned about periodontal disease being the cause of a dog or a cat's demise or causing them other problems and certainly causing them pain than I, are, than I am about an anesthetic procedure being a risk for them. And it's not risk-free, I'll never say that, but I'm far more concerned about dental disease causing them other problems and even uh, earlier mortality. And, and that's what we always want to avoid. What can we do to improve their quality of life? What can we do to make them feel better? Uh, and that's always the most important thing. And if they have periodontal disease, other types of dental disease, they're gonna be struggling with that pain. Um, something that we see taking place um, to some extent within the veterinary profession, but in many ways outside of 
uh, the veterinary profession is, is something that's called the anesthesia free dentistry. And um, it's really become a hot button issue, something I'm very passionate about as far as, um, in my opinion, it's wrong for a veterinarian to uh, perform one of these procedures. It's basically uh, taking up a, a dog, taking even a cat, they'll try it in cats, and they certainly can't polish the teeth. We'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, but it is something where I think it's, it's stressful for the pets. Uh, and it's next to impossible for them to do a complete uh, quality cleaning of the pet's teeth with them under anesthesia. And here's the thing. I, I, I don't like to polarize the issue. Uh, there are a lot of people that are performing what we call AFDs that you know, they're doing it with the best of intentions. They want to help these pets. Mm -hmm. But the problem is, is that they're doing more harm than good because they're only able to clean teeth above the gum line. They're not able to do anything below the gum line. And it's below the gum line that all the problems arise. So that's the key thing. Anesthesia-free dentistry cannot clean below the gum line, regardless of what some of their claims are. A pet is never going to allow an ultrasonic scaler or a hand scaler to go below, below the gum line. And that's where the rubber meets the road. That's where periodontal disease starts in earnest. Yeah, um, so that's something that they simply cannot perform with an AFD. And if they are, if they're trying to, to scale that, that tooth, they're going to leave a roughened surface. It's going to be etched. It's going to be rough. And so plaque bacteria love to grab onto a roughened, irregular surface. So when we have a patient under anesthesia uh, and we've done that complete cleaning with hand scaling instruments, with ultrasonic scalers, we then polish the teeth. If you look at the picture in the lower right, uh, we're polishing with a fluoride or a, a, a pumice paste. And we're not doing that to give them pearly whites. We're not doing that just to, to, to give them a nice smile. Yeah, uh, we're doing it to smooth out that roughened surface, to take away that more plaque retentive surface. And so if you look at those slides, the slide on the left is an electron microscope picture of the tooth surface after a cleaning. And yes, all the plaque and the calculus are removed, but it still is a very roughened surface. If you look at the image on the right, that's after polishing a much smoother surface that's much less likely for plaque to adhere to. So this is a case, this is Cowboy, a uh, Labrador who is an avid uh, field trial dog, a scent trial dog. And he came in first place just about every weekend. And his owner realized all of a sudden he was off in the field rather than first place. He was coming in like third or fourth place. He wasn't even getting a ribbon. And, uh, and he, loved, he loved what he was doing. He loved uh, going on these field trials with his owner, but he started to have a decreased performance in the field. So she realized something was up. She started to, uh, she went to a regular veterinarian. I had just seen Cowboy uh, a number of months earlier for a, a complete cleaning. And um, uh, she went to a regular veterinarian. He worked the case up. Everything was coming up normal as far as blood work, as far as his orthopedic exam, everything. And so he advised that, um, that she bring him in to me. And so I saw him about six months after the last cleaning that I had done. And on my oral exam, all I found was a little bit of bleeding on probing from the gingiva of this tiny little molar in the back of his mandible on one side. That was the only thing that I saw. The tooth wasn't fractured. It wasn't discolored. It wasn't loose. It wasn't mobile or anything. But then we took dental x-rays. And if you look at the uh, the x-ray on the left, there's a big abscess here. There's a big lucent area here, and that's just infection that's growing uh, around the root of that tooth. If you look at the other side, this is a normal x-ray. We have what we call the periodontal ligament here, normally around that tooth, and there's no abscess here like you see on this image. So I extracted that tooth. I removed it. There is no saving it. And it was just a simple, straightforward procedure, two sutures. It took me about five minutes to do. And then guess what? Cowboy was back in the field winning first place ribbons about two weeks later. That was the only thing that was wrong with him, was one small abscess tooth. 
And here's why I bring his case up. If we hadn't performed an anesthetic procedure on him and a dental cleaning and full mouth dental x-rays, we would have never found that abscess tooth. And you simply cannot take dental x-rays on an awake dog or cat. Um, it's not gonna work. You, they're not gonna hold still for that. There's no way that we can take dental x-rays in their mouth with them awake. And so an anesthesia-free dentistry procedure is not gonna catch a case like cowboy. Cowboy is going to go undiagnosed. He's going to continue to deal with that pain for that one tooth uh, because he, you know, he wouldn't have had the dental care that he needed. So uh, this is another dog that came into a friend of mine in Texas, a 10 year old lab. He had been having anesthesia free dental procedures for five years. The owner just noticed the increase in halitosis, bad breath. And so my colleague, has something called cone beam CT that I now have in my dental office. And if you look at the upper picture, it looks like there's nothing what we would call uh, along the lines of attachment loss. The gingiva looks normal. Uh, we can't tell that there's bone loss in this patient. But then we did what we call a, a 3D reconstruction on the cone beam scan. And they found all this bone loss, all this root exposure going on and teeth that unfortunately many of them are not viable. Uh, and that periodontal disease, that bone loss, what we call attachment loss, would have gone undiagnosed and untreated if that patient continued to have anesthesia-free dentistry. So, uh, you know, many different organizations in our profession have come out with position statements against anesthesia-free dentistry, many state associations. And the one that I'm obviously most proud of is the American Veterinary Dental College, my college, uh, for coming out uh, vehemently against these procedures because all of us in the college have seen uh, just one case after another, dogs going undiagnosed with their dental disease. Some states like Nevada have uh, basically outlawed those procedures and uh, they require that you take dental x-rays if you're going to anesthetize a dog and um, do a dental cleaning on them. Um, so again, why are people concerned? Well, maybe some people have lost a pet in the past to an anesthetic procedure and it's heartbreaking. And again, I, I, I stress to people, it's never risk-free. Fortunately, more and more as our profession grows, uh, those cases are becoming uh, fewer and fewer with the standards that are improving. Um, and it is something where I see clinics setting themselves apart by sending their, their technicians, their doctors for continuing education on anesthesia for um, looking at the medications that we use and using more and more safe anesthetics. Uh, our patients are, are being monitored in so many different ways uh, with anesthetic um, uh, blood, pressure, uh, blood pressure monitoring devices, uh, electrocardiograms, uh, body temperature, something that we call a capnograph that measures um, carbon dioxide in their airways pulse oximetry that measures their oxygen saturation levels, one different layer after another for improving the way that we monitor our patients. They're on IV fluids, they all have IV catheters in place. Um, they're getting pain relief and they're getting pain relief preemptively when they're dealing with painful situations. And that actually improves the quality of anesthesia. Um, so uh, again, I'll, I've seen one case after another where I'm far more concerned about periodontal disease being the cause of a dog's demise and really compromising the quality of life than I am about the risk of an anesthetic procedure that we take very seriously, that we never treat in a cavalier way, uh, but it is something where we see far more animals suffering from dental disease on a daily basis. And here's a neat thing. I have had one case after another in my career where I've had old eight-year-old dogs come into me with dental disease. And we would go and we would diagnose it, we treat it, we relieve their pain, and then they become young eight-year-old dogs. Or you have you know, young 12-year-old dogs that are being actively treated, that are getting the dental care that they need on a regular basis, and they're young 12-year-old dogs. Um, it, it sounds kind of counterintuitive, but it's really not the case because I've seen one situation after another where treating their dental disease makes them act younger because they're not in pain anymore. I've seen behavior and aggression problems 
go away and resolve or improve with dental care. And then once again, the risk of periodontal disease um, is far greater than an anesthetic procedure. And the risk of negative changes in, in other organ systems is far more significant when we're dealing with something like that. So Dr. Vall, you mentioned um, the, um, the surface of the teeth and what's below the gum line. Uh, I think it's really, really important that we, uh, we stop on this topic for a second and talk about um, dentistry. This, this isn't about cosmetics or purely straight teeth or purely white teeth or what we just think of in, in human terms as uh, this looks nice uh, to look at. Um, if you wouldn't mind just going back to that dental x-ray and explaining what percentage of the, of the teeth um, typically a person can see that's above the gum line versus, um, you know, the iceberg analogy, what's actually going on below um, to, uh, to really drive home what we do with dental x-rays that can only be done under anesthesia? Sure. So, um, you know, there's well over 50% for most of the teeth in a dog or a cat's mouth well over 50% of that tooth is below the gum line and, and making up the roots of that tooth. Um, and that's gonna vary from, from one tooth to another, but uh, on average, well over 50%. And that's where a lot of the pathology or the disease is gonna be. So yes, it's important to brush the crown, to clean the crown when we're doing our procedures, um, but the most important part of the cleaning is actually, again, below the gum line in that what we call gingival space. And then to go beyond that, that's the cleaning part, we have to use our diagnostics. Um, one of the things that my mentor, Tony Woodward, told me when I started to get into veterinary dentistry, and this is going back to 2004, he said, Patrick, you cannot practice quality veterinary dentistry without dental x-rays. It's impossible to do it. And I firmly believe that dental x-rays are now what we call the minimum standard of care. You cannot practice veterinary dentistry without dental x-rays. And if you look at that x-ray that we, we showed earlier, it's a perfect example why. Uh, that dog had an abscess of that root and it would have never been found uh, with, without a dental radiograph. And he would have remained in pain. And maybe some, some owners, when they have things like this going on, if they go undiagnosed, if they don't have dental x-rays taken, maybe they think that their dog is just kind of getting old, kind of slowing down um, and attributing it to just age rather than actual dental disease and, and pain. So um, I, I know that we see cases like that, unfortunately, all too frequently. Yeah, and our pets are our family. So, you know, they sleep in the beds with us. Um, they protect our children. They're there with us, um, you know, during times like COVID when we're feeling lonely. They're, they're part of our family. I have three small children and uh, I can't imagine not bringing them to the dentists for checkups. Um, I have dental x-rays at least once a year myself. And yeah, they're uncomfortable, um, but I know not to bite down. I know I'm not going to destroy a, you know, a, a five or $10,000 probe. Uh, but I still have them because, you know, it, it, it's really important to my life expectancy and to my family's life expectancy. I want the same thing for our pets. Uh, we, have a, we have a question here that's coming up in chat uh, from Instagram. It says, why does my dog need to be put under anesthesia for a dental when groomers do it without putting them under? Um, that's a great question. I'm gonna I'm gonna take the first stab at this, Dr. Vall, and I'd like to pass the mic over to you uh, because this is something that I dealt with in practice almost every day, and my response is the same as uh, it would be for a human being uh, that said, "I went to my hairdressers. I go once every three months or once every six months, and they brush my teeth at the hairdressers." Um, we would look at that as completely unacceptable. That's not okay. Um, brushing your teeth four times a year and having your hairdresser do it is not what we're talking about here. Uh, we're not talking about a gimmick. If, uh, if you need help learning how to brush your teeth uh, or your pet's teeth, we should do this properly through the veterinarian. Um, but this is just part of your, um, your, your full 
dental hygiene suite. You're doing stuff at home. You're doing stuff in partnership with your veterinarian um, along the way. Uh, so Dr. Val, maybe you could speak on that and give some in input as well. Sure, sure. So we know that if we brush our dog's teeth once a day, that we stop the progression or greatly slow the, the recurrence, the onset of periodontal disease. So that's once a day. If we brush our dog's teeth every other day, then you're only delaying the progression at best. If we're brushing our dog's teeth, say once a week, we're not having any positive impact on their dental health. So when their teeth are brushed at a groomer's every six weeks, eight weeks, whatever it may be, it's having no beneficial effect uh, on their pet's teeth at all. And I don't wanna you know, fault groomers, you know, I, I hope they're doing it with good intentions, but I would tell the pet owner, save your money, don't pay extra for something like that. Um, start brushing your dog's teeth, it's advised by your, your veterinarian. The other thing is if, if a pet has dental disease going on, if they have gingivitis and they're having their teeth brushed, it hurts and their gums can bleed. And so there are some cases where I have dogs coming into me with advanced dental disease and I'll tell the, you know, the pet owner, yes, I believe in dental care yet, yeah, obviously. Yes, I believe in brushing uh, teeth, but I'm gonna tell you not to do it with your dog right now until they come into us and have a complete cleaning under anesthesia until we're able to do diagnostics to look for painful things. And then once we dealt with that, once their mouth has settled down, then start brushing their teeth. But for it to be meaningful, it's gotta be every day, ideally every day. So educate us on how we can start that process. How can I teach my family members, my grandparents, um, how to proactively learn to brush my dog or cat's teeth from the time they're a puppy or a kitten, or if you don't get them until they're a bit older, um, we want them to be taken care of as well. How can we start? Can you can you educate us a little bit on that? Sure, sure. We have a really good video that we put together by uh, one of my residents, Dr. Melissa Guillory, and she has some really good tips in that video as far as how you get a dog used to having their teeth brushed. Hello, my name is Dr. Melissa Guillory. I completed a dentistry residency with Dr. Patrick Fall in animal dental care and neurosurgery and recently successfully completed phase one of my board examinations. Today I'm going to talk about and display how to brush your dog's teeth using Louie, my own personal dog. So first of all, we need toothpaste. Um, I'm using Verbac enzymatic toothpaste here. This is poultry flavor, which is very popular, especially with Louie. Then we also have a toothbrush. We have a, a larger size and then a smaller side as well too. Because of the shape of his muzzle, I'm going to be using the larger side. So how we start this out is I'm going to first give Louie a little taste of the toothpaste, which he really likes. Good boy. And then I'm going to put a nice strip of the toothpaste on the toothbrush. Then we'll start brushing the teeth. And I typically start on one side, I'll work with the front or incisor teeth and work my way on either the left or right side from canine back to the cheek teeth and then move to the other side. So here we're gonna start on this right side, incisors, the upper one, so brush in about five seconds, focusing more on the outside surface of the tooth, moving to the canine or also known as the fang tooth, then working our way down to those premolar and molars. And then I'm gonna work now from back to front of the lower mandibular teeth and then working my way to those lower incisors. And then we do the same thing on the other side. The whole process of brushing teeth typically takes probably less than a couple minutes. And you can see some dogs really enjoy this. And I think if we set a certain time each day to brush the teeth, such as morning or evening, and do it in a consistent place, such as the bathroom where we brush our teeth, it can be very much a fun habit for dogs. After I brush the teeth, I usually give Louie a little extra toothpaste fla flavor as a reward, and then we're done. And that is brushing your teeth with Louie. So Lauren Beck is a certified vet technician up in Montana, 
at our branch clinic up there. And uh, she's been a certified vet tech for a number of years, but she just recently finished her VTS training in dentistry. So VTS stands for Veterinary Trained Specialist. She went through a number of years of added coursework, a um, lot of extra continuing education hours, logging cases, showing um, proficiency in a number of different tasks that technicians will do for dental procedures. And it's a pretty arduous process that Lauren went through. And uh, she just, it was uh, just a wonderful thing for our practice team to uh, see her get the good news of passing her VTS test this past fall. Hey there, my name is Lauren Beck and for the last 13 years I've been practicing as a certified veterinary technician. Over half of these were with a board certified veterinary dentist who actually inspired me to uh, specialize in pet dentistry. This was not easy. Uh, I actually spent two and a half years uh, logging cases, writing case reports, studying and taking two tests to receive my VTS in veterinary dentistry but this was all worth it. Now I use it every day working at Montana Pet Dentistry and Oral Surgery. I also use it training practices around town and uh, my coworkers, the importance of oral health in our patients. Periodontal disease has actually been reported in up to 80% of dogs and 70% of cats by the age of two, but is very commonly not treated um, until much later in life. I wanna use my VTS uh, to help these practices advocate for their patients and help owners understand the importance of oral health and help get it treated sooner. Thanks. One of the great things about my job is the people I get to work with. I work with amazing individuals, um, fellow veterinarians, um, you know, one after another that just make me better, a better veterinarian. Um, but even more so the technical staff that we get to work with uh, we work with certified vet technicians in our practice, and they are some of the hardest working individuals that I have ever had the pleasure of working with. They are committed. Uh, they work long hours. Uh, they love what they do. They see the difference that they make. They see the impact that they make um, on our patients and on the, uh, the, their quality of life and the quality of life of the, the pet owners caring for them. Uh, and they are some of the most wonderful people that I, I've, I get the pleasure of working with on a daily basis. So Morgan is a certified veterinary technician. She just finished her coursework. Uh, she passed her CBT test, her accreditation test, a number of weeks ago. And she's also a True Panion part-time employee and just one of the better people that we get to work with on a daily basis. And uh, we love having her as part of our team. My name is Morgan Tahara. I'm one of the certified veterinary technicians at Animal Dental Care and Oral Surgery in Colorado Springs. As a veterinary technician at Animal Dental Care and Oral Surgery, we formulate anesthetic plans with the veterinarian for our patient. We also monitor their anesthesia, perform the cone beam CT, CT imaging. We assist the doctors during the procedure, whether that be a root canal or oral surgery. I myself, I have a bachelor's degree in biology and I've been a veterinary technician for 18 years. I recently graduated from Apex School of Veterinary Technology and passed the Veterinary Technician National Exam in December. Becoming a CVT was a lot of fun. It was also really exciting. Uh, something that happened is it made me hungry to continue learning and let me set goals for myself that I otherwise would not have been able to achieve. Something else that I do is I provide local support in veterinary hospitals for True Panion, which I've done for about seven years. I visit the veterinary hospitals and educate their teams about how to talk about medical insurance to their clients. And I can see how it plays a crucial role in their veterinary careers and also enriches their patients' lives. So we've got some great questions here. I want to I want to make sure we don't leave people hanging. We've got literally hundreds of questions coming through, so we're going to get through as many as we can. But the first one, we're going to hit we're going to hit them in order. What are the pros and cons of spray-ons or water additives to remove plaque, Dr. Ball? Sure. So there are a lot of products out there. You can go to Amazon, you can go to just about any pet supply um, dealer and they'll have these products that 
They claim that by spraying them on your pet's teeth, that it's gonna magically take away plaque and tartar and you don't need to do anything else. And so what are the pros of that? Absolutely nothing because they're baseless and they're not true. There's no data behind them. And the claims that they make, they're, they're the equivalent of snake oil. Uh, and they're just, there are so many different products that are peddled out there making those, those claims. Um, so the, co the con is that they don't work, they don't do the pet any good, and they probably give a pet owner a false sense of security as far as feeling like they don't need to do any further dental care. Water additives, it depends. There are some good products out there that have good data behind them that have been tested and peer reviewed, uh, and, and they can help. Here's the key thing, again, they're never gonna take the place of brushing. Brushing is always going to be the gold standard. And so if I have a client who, again, has the problem case, the, the dog, the cat with a lot of dental disease going on, they're doing everything they can, and we may add a water additive because I think that that's where it's going to be truly beneficial. That's helpful. Thank you. And I'd, I'd add in that um, if your kid said to you, um, I'm never going to brush my teeth again because I have something to spray in my mouth, you would absolutely not let that happen. Wish it was um, that so easy. Uh, yeah, I wish it was that easy too. But here's another question as well. Um, thank you for submitting these. Will you please mention um, that, that dogs fed a raw food or clean diet do not need tartar or plaque removed? Now we've uh, we've debunked this earlier, um, but but Dr. Val, let's let's drill down again and let's make sure we uh, we absolutely let people know um, that this is this, this is inaccurate um, and not true. But but please go ahead and educate on that. Sure, I think the answer is kind of in the question. Um, they say they don't need to have tartar or plaque removed, but it's there. It's always there. Plaque in the absence of dental care is always there. It's always on the surface of the tooth and it's gonna always be underneath the gum line. So, you know, a raw diet is still gonna cause plaque to form on the surface of the crown. Um, and then the other key thing is that there's absolutely no data to support that as far as the, the need for it. Animals in the wild eat a raw diet. Uh, animals in the wild are far from free of dental disease. Uh, we know that to be true. So there's just nothing to really support that claim in my opinion. Thanks for that. So here's the next one. And this, this is more of a statement. It says, you don't have to brush your dog's teeth. Give them natural chews uh, or yak milk sticks. Uh, teeth are cleaned. Uh, this person saying their dogs, um, the dog collects uh, his sticks after every meal and gives them a good chomp. Teeth are gleaming white and no stress. Could you? Let us know. Let us know your thoughts, Dr. Sure. Robert. Here's what I tell people to go by as far as what to give your dog to chew on. Um, can you bend or break it? Can you pound a nail with it? Or is it something that you wouldn't want thrown at your knee? Um, if you can't answer those questions, then it's too hard for them to chew on. So things like pizzle sticks, bully sticks, all these different things that are out there, uh, truth be told, they're really good for my business uh, because I see so many dogs with fractured teeth from these different things. So it's so many different chew toys and, and items that you can't bend or break. That you certainly wouldn't want thrown at your knee. Some of them you could pound a nail with, and they're just damaging uh, dogs' teeth time and time again. And I see that on a daily basis in my practice. Um, even something as benign as tennis balls can be harmful to a dog's teeth because they have those fibers in them. And then if they get a little bit of dirt, a little bit of grit in those fibers, they can actually wear down teeth, just like sandpaper on wood. Yeah, um, so you can see that as well. Um, and so, you know, what about the cases where people say, well, they, they don't have calculus on their teeth and I give them this hard chew toy every day. Well, they're probably right. And it's basically cracking the calculus off their teeth, but also cracking their teeth. And we see 
undiagnosed crown fractures time and time again, and sometimes they, they're severe enough to actually expose the underlying pulp of the tooth, which is painful and nothing but a route of infection to get down into the roots of the teeth. Here's the next question. Commercial kibble and all cooked form ruins teeth. Uh, why isn't this a topic? So I think that's a, that's a statement that somebody is uh, intending to make and, and maybe wants us to, uh, to either validate that or to debunk it. Um, Patrick, can you help with that? Sure. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't think that there's anything to really support that data wise. Um, we know that there are plenty of uh, prescription hard kibble diets that do have data behind them that don't ruin their teeth that help um, Re, you know, remove plaque and calculus from their teeth. There's definitely data to support that. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't feel that that ruins their teeth. Now, I, I will say that in many situations, you know, what about cats and, and cats who won't eat kibble or they, are, um, they prefer canned food? Um, I'm not going to sit here and tell you that it's wrong to give your cat canned food. We have to stop and think, you know, what are their mouths made for? Well, they're made for shearing meat, for eating mice, right? And so canned food isn't nearly as bad as some people make it out to be as far as causing dental disease or anything like that. Yeah, um, so, uh, you know, there are a few different ways of looking at that for sure. Yeah, um, but I don't believe that there's anything that supports commercial kibble ruining pet's teeth. Why don't you take this one, Dr. Bell? Sure. So the next question is, what about cats? Is dental care for cats different or harder than for dogs or other pets? And it certainly is. Um, it's, uh, it's not easy to brush your cat's teeth. I have clients that do it, but unfortunately it's, it's a low percentage. Uh, cats want things on their own terms and as loving as, and, and as affectionate as they are, uh, brushing their teeth is a challenge. And the key thing is to start at a young age, go slow, just like Dr. Guillory's video um, for her dog, Louie said, you know, I tell people with cats, go slow, let them get used to the taste and the texture of the toothpaste. Uh, just do that multiple times a day and then slowly start to get in there uh, with a soft bristle brush, a fingertip brush, something along those lines. And even then, sometimes cats are just not going to allow it. If it's a rodeo, it, um, we're going to lose. The, the cat's not going to allow us to brush their teeth, but we want to try. There are some dental gels that um, they don't object to that you can put on the surface of their gums uh, on their teeth, and that'll inhibit plaque as well. Not as thorough as brushing, but they can definitely help. Um, and then here's the key thing, especially for cats. It's so important, at least once a year, to have their teeth completely cleaned under anesthesia and to have full mouth dental x-rays performed, uh, especially in the absence of home care. We got one more here. My cat is 16 years old. What can be done with a cat that old? Yeah, great question. One we get frequently. Um, so old age by itself is not a disease. And I don't say that in a cavalier or um, I don't want to brush people off when they tell me how old their cats are. And I get it. I understand. But age by itself is not a reason to not uh, have your pet's teeth cleaned. In fact, they need it even more. And so many of these older pets are dealing with dental disease, dealing with pain. So, you know, the way I handle those cases when they come into me and we have cats and dogs that come into us um, that are senior pets. They um, may have kidney disease, heart disease, other problems going on. That by itself is not a reason to avoid anesthesia. The way I handle it in my practice is I'm going to have a, um, an anesthetist come in and manage that case. We have in our profession certified veterinary technicians that are what we call VTSs or veterinary trained specialists, and their specialty is anesthesia. And so I'll frequently have a VTS veterinary technician come in and manage those cases for us. And we can do senior pets, even 16 years old, um, very, very safely. We do them all the time. And, and here's the beautiful thing. 
when we handle them that way, they thrive and they do so well time and time again. I've, I've had one senior pet after another with severe dental disease uh, really do well after procedures like that. That's great. Thanks for that. So we've got one final question here. Um, does True Panion cover dental disease, accidents, illnesses? Um, what does that look like? And what I'll say as the chief veterinary officer of True Panion is uh, I, I want True Panion to pay uh, Dr. Val's bills. So when Dr. Val comes to you with, uh, he's using the, the, the cone beam CT, digital dental x-rays, um, anesthesia technician, whether he's doing a root canal, a cap, a crown, an extraction, um, you know, an, an abscess repair, you name it, any of those things that he spent a, a lifetime studying to be able to treat to make your pet live a longer, happier life. Those are things that we covered, unexpected accidents and illnesses across the board. So let us pay the bill, please. Let us pay the veterinarian for you before you even leave the hospital. That's exactly what we're here for. So one of the things that I'd really like to encourage pet owners to, to do is to get insurance. It is something where time and time again, I've seen that give people so much peace of mind because they can follow treatment plans and we love to see people come in with True Panion insurance because then we get to do uh, what we know the pet needs. Time and time again, we have unexpected dental issues that come up, fractured teeth. And in my practice, I, I'm, I'm not just a veterinary dentist, I'm a veterinary oral surgeon. We have so many um, accident cases that come into us, dogs that are hit by a car, kicked by a horse, you know, unfortunately attacked by another animal. And they'll come into us with facial trauma, with jaw fractures, and uh, things that we're, we're trained for. And True Panion, um, they help with that. They, uh, it, it's just something that gives people such a beautiful peace of mind in those situations and allows us to do what we're good at, uh, what we excel at in taking care of those pets. Mm -hmm. Thanks, everyone, for joining us today for a topic with teeth. What's behind your pet smile?